Hi class, it's Professor Kemper again, yay. Um, so here we are on the last bit of content for exam two. And in this lecture, we're gonna be talking about thyroid and parathyroid disorders, some more endocrine. So let's get right into it. Here are our learning objectives for today, and I just want to preface by saying that if you're going to hear some panting in the background, um, my husband's canine um, is currently in the room with me, so he might be moving around and panting a lot, so sorry about that background noise. Bear. Okay. Um, so here's our agenda for today. And so we'll do a brief overview of the endocrine system. Um, we'll go right into thyroid gland disorders, and then we will talk about parathyroid gland disorders. We'll start with hypo, and then we'll go into hyper. So our endocrine system has a lot to do with hormone secretions, and these help to regulate and integrate bodily functions. Um, our endocrine system works really closely with our nervous system and they each balance each other out. So if there's a disorder happening and we have irregularities with our endocrine, um, there will be some dysfunction with our nervous system as well. And you'll see that with some of these disorder clinical manifestations. So the hormones that we're going to be specifically discussing in this lecture are the thyroid hormones so TSH or thyroid stimulating hormone, thyroxine, also known as T4, and then triothyronine, which is T3, and then also calcitonin. And with the parathyroid, we talk about parathormone or the parathyroid hormone, which you'll hear more commonly. And these are both found in the lower neck and anterior to the trachea, as you can see in this picture. Uh, the thyroid gland, which looks like a butterfly, it's about five centimeters long and three centimeters wide, and it's highly vascularized. It actually receives five times as much blood per minute as the liver does. So thinking about that as we discuss surgical interventions with the thyroid gland, we know that these patients are going to be at risk for hemorrhage and bleeding. Um, and then the parathyroid glands, there are four of them, two on each side of the back of the butterfly, the thyroid, are situated in the neck and they're embedded in the posterior side of the thyroid. So if we turn this client around, we would be able to see them from the back, but I can't do that with this picture, so let's just get into talking about more of these glands in depth. So let's start with the thyroid gland. So what does the thyroid gland do? And what are its major responsibilities? Well, the thyroid gland produces hormones that regulate the body's metabolic rate um, and also our growth and development. And it plays a role in controlling heart, muscle, and digestive function, brain development, and bone maintenance. It never gets a day off, and it's constantly producing hormones to regulate those functions. The thyroid also helps to control calcium balance by releasing calcitonin in response to high plasma calcium levels in the blood. And so when we have high plasma calcium levels in the blood, what calcitonin does is increases that calcium deposit back into the bones. So an important component that our thyroid needs in order to properly function is iodine. And we'll talk about that on the next slide. But how does our thyroid regulate itself? It regulates itself through a negative feedback loop, which is a hormone chain reaction. So when the levels of T3 and T4 increase, um, it will prevent the release of um, thyroid stimulating hormone. And when T3 and T4 levels drop, the feedback loop starts again. So the system allows your body to maintain a constant level of thyroid hormone in your body, which is what we need.
So how does iodine fit in? So the function of our thyroid gland is to take iodine, which is found in many foods, and convert it into those thyroid hormones, the T4 and T3. And thyroid cells are actually the only cells in our body which can absorb iodine. And the cells combine iodine and amino acid, uh, known as tyrosine, to make T3 and T4. And then T3 and T4 are released into the bloodstream and they're transported throughout the body where they control the metabolism. And every cell in our body depends upon thyroid hormones for this regulation of their metabolism. So very important that we get enough iodine. Um, so these are a couple of important questions to ask um, for our client who we think might be exhibiting signs and symptoms of hypo or hyperthyroidism. And we're trying to test for hormonal abnormalities. Or these questions might be for the client who already has the, these disorders because the answers to these questions can result in changing treatment or maybe deciphering diagnosis. But there's more information about this in your book if you really want to sift through this chapter. Um, it's actually a really short chapter, which was pleasantly surprising because endocrine, it's not my fave, I'm not gonna lie. But we're gonna make this fun and exciting and um, I have a great activity planned, so let's do it. Okay, so we'll start with hypothyroidism or not enough production of those hormones T3 and T4. And this is triggered by primary and secondary causes. So let's start with primary causes. Hypothyroidism um, can happen because of an autoimmune disease and it's called Hashimoto's disease. This is when the body creates antithyroid antibodies that attack the thyroid tissue and it can cause progressive fibrosis. And usually the diagnosis can be quite challenging. So consequently, the condition is sometimes not diagnosed until late in the disease process. But um, this autoimmune disorder progressively destroys that thyroid and thus rendering it incapable of producing those hormones that our body needs to properly function. Another primary disorder would be from a thyroidectomy. So clients can go from having hyperthyroidism where we go ahead and remove part or um, most of that thyroid tissue and then we create hypothyroidism. And lastly, we have cretinism, which is an abnormal mental and physical development, and it results from a deficiency of thyroid hormone in fetal development or early life stages. And it's typically characterized by intellectual disability, small stature, and th thickening of facial features. That's more of a pediatric disorder, um, so I bring it up briefly, but not something I will test you on. You might hear about it again when you get into peds um, in your senior year. So then we move on to secondary causes like medications such as lithium or iodine deficiency. So lithium and iodine deficiency can both cause what is known as a goiter, um, which is that top picture on the right. It's an en enlarged thyroid gland, and it's usually very common with hypothyroidism, and it doesn't really result in complications, but obviously we want the client to have their primary provider um, check it out because sometimes these can cause other problems, just thinking about the airway, and then in rare cases, it can also mean cancer. So let's get into clinical manifestations of hypothyroidism. And these typically reflect the decrease in the client's metabolism. So think about fatigue, lethargy, weight gain, cold intolerance, and dry skin. We might also see um, bradycardia from changes in the electrical conduction system. It's slowing down. In women, we might see changes in their menstrual cycle, um, severe 
thyroidism can lead to subnormal body temperatures and pulse rate, and we'll discuss that with complications. So here it is, the complication of hypothyroidism is myxedema coma. And this is a rare but life-threatening condition, and it's a gradual or a sudden impairment of consciousness or coma due to hypothyroidism. Uh, essentially, what is happening is the metabolism is shutting down, and it can progress to stupor, coma, and then death. Um, so the patient is hypothermic and unconscious. Um, sometimes it's caused by undiagnosed hypothyroidism, or it can be due to an infection. Sometimes medications, you know, if they're not taking their medications for their hypothyroidism properly, or it could also be caused by exposure to cold or trauma. So what do we do in this case? Well, we have to give them the IV uh, thyroid hormone replacement because they are so severely hypothyroid. Um, so we want to give that um, rapidly. We want to monitor them closely. So they're typically in the ICU setting, probably will be intubated like in this picture. Um, we'll treat the hypotension with maybe some IV fluids or vasopressor drugs, depending on the cause of the hypotension, and then really just rewarming their bodies with a warm blanket or a bear hugger. So how do we diagnose hypothyroidism? So the first thing the provider would start with is drawing some blood work. Um, to check out those hormones. Specifically, they'll draw a TSH, that thyroid stimulating hormone first. And then, <laughs> excuse me. And then depending on this, if this is elevated, the next thing that we would typically do is repeat this um, thyroid stimulating hormone again and add on a T4 level. So if the thyroid stimulating hormone is high again and the T4 level is low, then we have a diagnosis of hypothyroidism and we can start them on replacement therapy. Um, in some cases, they might draw a T3 level, but um, it's usually just the TSH and the T4. So the opposite of each other, the TSH is going to be high because it's trying to compensate um, and, and create more um, hormone release um, via the thyroid, but the thyroid isn't working improperly, so there's not enough hormones um, being produced. Hopefully that makes sense. So here's our um, replacement therapy, which is levothyroxine, and this is a synthetic or a man-made T4. Um, so levothyroxine takes a while to kick in, uh, initial therapy doesn't take full effect until about like six weeks in because the half-life of levothyroxine is so long. And usually they calculate the dosage via body weight in kilograms to start. Typically they'll start low and then titrate up and they'll adjust the doses every four to six weeks by looking at the client's TSH levels. And once a client is started on this therapy, we really want to watch them closely for adverse reactions, especially cardiovascular events like palpitations, tachycardia, and dyspnea. Because think about it, their bodies have been used to being without this hormone for so long, and now all of a sudden we're introducing that back into their body, and it can be a really drastic change for um, clients, especially with those who already have established cardiovascular disease or with older age. Levothyroxine enhances those cardiovascular effects of catecholamines like epinephrine and norepinephrine, which we know can increase blood pressure and heart rate. We want to educate our clients to take this medication on an empty stomach first thing in the morning and at the same time every day, um, and that they'll be on this medication for the rest of their lives. So it's really important that they remember to take that medication every day and go get their blood work done, you know, every four to six weeks. So some side effects I have listed as well as some drug to drug interactions. 
um, just knowing that in older adults with hypothyroidism, they have altered functioning of their liver and their kidneys. So effects like hypnotics and sedatives, analgesic medications with this thyroid replacement therapy are prolonged. So just as a nurse, be monitoring for adverse side effects. So nursing priorities, and these are just some of the priorities that go along with hypothyroidism straight from um, your book, pages 1458 to 1460, um, if you wanted to take a look. So thinking about nursing interventions that would coincide with these priorities, so things like altered cardiac output and oxygenation, we would definitely want to be monitoring them closely with a cardiac monitor assessing their vital signs more frequently, identifying if the client has the presence of atherosclerosis. And by doing this, we would look at their cholesterol panel um, because that would put them at increased risk of cardiac alterations or dysrhythmias, angina, et cetera. Fatigue and activity intolerance. Um, our goal would be to increase our client's participation in their activities, increase their independence as much as possible. Um, we would probably space out their activities as tolerated or group their care together um, by discussing that with the CNA and provider. If they're confused, and this is really associated with myxedema coma, um, once they come back to, we would reorient them to time, place, situation, um, provide the client and family with reassurance, and then lots of education. Um, <clears throat> things like constipation are a nursing priority, and we would want to be increasing fluid intake, providing high fiber foods, monitoring their bowel function, increasing their mobility. A lot of education here with knowledge deficit and risk for nutrition imbalance. Um, the other nursing priorities really go along with a complication of myxedema coma. Remember with hypothyroidism that everything in our bodies is being slowed down. So thinking about the entire body becoming altered by this is really important on how we're going to prioritize our care. So here's an outline of what you might be doing for nursing care for the client with hypothyroidism. Again, it's not just about monitoring the lab values of the thyroid. We need our thyroid to properly function because it controls metabolic activity, cell, repl cell replication, brain development, and it's needed for normal growth and development throughout our entire lives. And so that really concludes the hypo side of the thyroid. Now we're going to get into the hyperthyroid. So hyperthyroidism is the opposite of hypothyroidism, where we have excessive secretion of thyroid hormones. And one of the most, you know, most common causes is another autoimmune disorder, and this one is known as Graves' disease. This is where clients will have abnormal stimulation of that thyroid gland, and it creates an excessive amount of thyroid hormone. It affects women about eight times as much as men, with typical onset being about ages 20 to 40 years old. And it can, can wow, it can, can, wow, okay, I can't speak, sorry. It can appear right after a severe emotional upset or severe stress or infection, but we really don't completely understand this disease yet, so more research needs to be done and probably funding. There are other causes as well, but we're really going to focus on Graves' disease for this section. So clinical manifestations of hyperthyroidism, we'll think about how they would be related to an increase in our metabolic rate and oxygen consumption. So the client would be anxious, restless, irritable. Remember that nervous system goes along with our um, endocrine system. They might have tremors, tachycardia, um, may complain of palpitations. They might be sweaty and have heat intolerance, like you can see in this picture. Uh, increased appetite, diarrhea, weight loss, thin skin. They also may have bulging eyes, like you can see in this picture in the last picture on the last slide, and we call this exothalamus. 
So just thinking about what kinds of clinical manifestations you would see if the client has hyper versus hypothyroidism. And assessment and diagnostics are going to be the opposite of hypothyroidism. So we're going to be seeing a low thyroid stimulating hormone and a high T4 level. Um, again, sometimes they'll draw the T3 and that will be high as well. And the other thing they will do is they'll have the client swallow a pill with radioactive iodine and then they'll scan the patient with an ultrasound looking device like in this picture. It's a, called a gamma probe to show a visual image of the uptake pattern of the iodine and the amount of radioactive iodine taken up by the thyroid helps us to determine if Graves disease or another condition is causing the hyperthyroidism. So the treatment here with hyperthyroidism is obviously to stop that excess secretion of thyroid hormone because we're getting way too much. So there are three mainstay treatments. One is radioactive iodine therapy. Then we have antithyroid medications like theonamides. And we can also do surgery like a subtotal thyroidectomy. They all share the same complications, which are either recurrent hyperthyroidism, so we'll fix the hyperthyroidism for a little bit and then it'll come right back, um, and then permanent hypothyroidism. So now we'll need to put them on lifetime replacement therapy. So not the greatest options, but yeah, this is what we got. So let's start with radioactive iodine therapy. This is the first treatment of choice for clients who have thyrotoxicosis, multinodule goiters, toxic adenomas. It's pretty successful and effective in about 80 to 90% of cases. And the goal of this therapy is to eliminate the hyperthyroidism state by damaging or destroying the tissue. Remember we said that all of the iodine taken up in the body goes straight to the thyroid gland? Well, this is why we use radioactive iodine because it targets the thyroid gland. Um, and this process takes time. It takes a few weeks for the client to see results. And the outcome of this is going to be hypothyroidism. So thyroid replacement therapy will need to be initiated afterwards, but throughout this therapy, we'll need to monitor and educate the client about complications. And because of the radioactive iodine destroying the thyroid tissue, there's going to be an acute release of thyroid hormone, and that may increase symptoms of hyperthyroidism. Um, and we call this thyroid storm, dum, dum, dum. Um, so thyroid storm is a life-threatening condition that will send the client into arrhythmias, uh, severe fever, neurologic impairment, and this can then lead to heart failure, circulatory collapse, and dangerous elevation of the body temperature, so also death. Um, so what do we use when this complication is happening? Well, we'll use beta blockers because remember there's uh, they're not only helping to decrease heart rate um, and a little bit of blood pressure, but they help to reduce that sympathetic nervous system um, and those catecholamines such as epinephrine and norepinephrine, they'll de decrease those. Um, and we also want to give other things, but we'll talk about that again in a bit. So when we place someone on radioactive iodine, we really need to be educating about radioactive precautions and what this entails. So body fluids will be radioactive and when, um, we wanna let our clients know that if they have a partner, we really want them to sleep in a separate room. We wanna have them double flush the toilet. We don't want them to share utensils or cups, towels, food, linen. Um, we want them to avoid intercourse or kissing. And this usually will be for however long they are on therapy and usually however long the provider states. Because we don't wanna expose anyone else to the radiation. 
So other solutions here, if radioactive iodine is not the client's best option, or sometimes clients choose not to go with radioactive iodine, it sounds like a scary um, thing to be radioactive. So uh, we could put them on theotomy, theonamides, um, and these are antithyroid drugs. So think about these drugs as halting that synthesis that needs to occur in order for our bodies to absorb the thyroid hormones. So medications like PTU and methylmazine, I think I butcher these like pharmacological like meds. Anyway, um, these block or inhibit that excess production of thyroid hormones. Um, in different stages of the synthesis. So that conversion from T4 to T3 or during hormone release, these meds stop those from occurring. And they're used in conjunction, in conjunction with surgery or also during radioactive iodine treatment until the client is what we call euthyroid, which means they're neither hyper or hypo. Um, and just like levithyroxine, these medications take several weeks to kick in and the client has symptom relief because there is sick. Yeah, so OK, let me start over. So just like levithyroxine, these medications take several weeks to start kicking in. So it's going to be a little bit before the client has symptom relief and they already have a significant amount of hormone that is already in their system. So toxic complications with these medications are rare, but if you'll want your client to report any signs and symptoms of infection, such as fever, pharyngitis, mouth ulcers, rash, because these medications can lead to a granulocytosis or thrombocytopenia. So you'll want to report that to the provider and they will probably have the client stop the medication. On the other hand, you don't want the client to stop their own medication abruptly um, because they can cause a relapse in their hyperthyroidism again within six months. And then we have subtotal thyroidectomy, and this is indicated for individuals who have been unresponsive to antithyroid therapy or for those who are pregnant where they cannot take those antithyroid medications. Um, it can also be used in clients with very large bleeders and it, it's causing tracheal compression or patients with possible malignancy or thyroid cancer. So preoperatively, we will be providing them with antithyroid drugs, beta blockers. We want to be stopping antiplatelet medications or anticoagulants because remember, we want to decrease that hemorrhage risk in the thyroid is very vascular. And then our preoperative goals is really to reduce that client's stress and anxiety because we want to avoid that precipitation of thyroid storm from occurring and stress can lead to that. Um, other preoperative education, um, we want to advise them about the dietary guidance to meet their metabolic needs after the thyroidectomy, um, avoidance of caffeinated beverages and other stimulants, and then we want to explain the tests and procedures that are going to be occurring um, and how we will support and position their head and neck after surgery. So a subtotal thyroidectomy is a removal of about 90% of the thyroid. So we're going to um, continue talking about how that is going to alter their function. So postoperatively, what we'll be do is um, monitor their vital signs very closely. Um, watch for any potential airway impairment um, and hyperthyroid rebound. So wa still watching for thyroid storm. Um, also, you know, we I just said that thyroid um, tissue is highly vascularized. So we want to watch for potential bleeding and hematoma form formation and also checking the posterior dressing. Obviously, they just had surgery. We want to assess and provide pain relief measures. 
Um, we'll be positioning them in a semi fowler's um, position and supporting their head and neck with pillows. We don't want them really like stretching or straining their neck. Um, assessing their voice, discouraging excessive talking, but figuring out a way that um, both of you can communicate um, without them um, excessively using their, their voice because we want that tissue to start healing. So, and then with a subtotal thyroidectomy, they are at high risk for hypocalcemia. And this is related to that injury or removal of the parathyroid glands. So we really wanna assess with hypocalcemia for the Shavasix and the Trousseau sign. We'll talk about that in a little bit. So, like I just said, postoperative complications include hemorrhage, respiratory distress, hypocalcemia, laryngeal nerve damage, and then since they just had surgery, um, they have an opening um, near their brain, pretty close, so they're at risk for meningitis and increased intracranial pressure. So watching out for any signs and symptoms of those complications, and then um, a thyroid storm, which is that rare life-threatening emergency um, where it's hyperthyroidism times 100. So what are we going to do? We're going to monitor for cardiac dysrhythmias. they will probably be on a cardiac monitor, um, administering the previously discussed medications, ensuring adequate oxygenation, giving IV fluids and electrolytes, maybe some calcium, um, providing a calm and quiet room and encouraging rest, providing them nutrition, reducing their anxiety, you know, getting them up and extra, I mean, getting them up and able to, you know, stay out of bed, prevent further complications, obviously like D DVTs or skin breakdown. Um, we might be doing frequent linen changes and this is secondary to profuse diaphoresis because remember they might still have that hyperthyroidism. Um, it's going to take a while for those hormones to get out of their body. So just being aware of that. So a post subtotal thyroidectomy, the nursing care. We are going to put a tracheostomy tray and at least calcium glucate, calcium gluconate next to their bedside, um, because again, they might be they're at increased risk of complications like hypocalcemia, and then airway. Um, we're always checking to see if um, their airway is doing okay. Um, so we want to keep them in a semi fowler's position, support their head um, and neck with pillows. Again, have the client avoid flexion and extension of the neck. Pain control. Um, it's post-op day one. We'll probably integrate a soft diet on day two. Um, we could use throat lozenges, sips of, you know, warm fluid, um, not hot, warm or cool. Um, and then obviously discharge instructions, we'll be asking them to frequently follow up with their healthcare provider because we'll be checking their hormone levels until things settle out, um, educating them on their calories and diet that will return to normal, using that iodized salt. Um, our body still needs iodine, so uh, avoiding high temperatures and then reporting symptoms of hypothyroidism. Okay, so now onto those little buttons on our butterfly-shaped thyroid gland. And there are four of them, and they're called the parathyroid glands. So what do these little buttons do? Well, this gland or these glands produce a parathormone that helps regulate calcium and phosphorus metabolism. So when our parathormone increases, so does our calcium level. Well, where do we find calcium? And does this hormone magically create a high amount of calcium? No, it has to come from somewhere. Um, 
So it's drawn out from our kidneys or our intestines and bones. And normally our parathyroid has a negative feedback system as well, just like the thyroid. So when there's too much calcium in the blood, our parathyroid um, knows to stop producing parathormone and thus calcium will stop being absorbed from our bones, intestines, and kidneys. And parathyroid hormone also regulates phosphorus. So when the calcium level is high, there is a lower level of phosphorus and vice versa, like a seesaw. When one goes up, the other one goes down. Just like in this picture. So thinking about our nursing priorities, um, just as we go along in this the next few slides, we'll think about what are the parathyroid glands responsible for, what do they provide to the body, and what are we most concerned about if they're malfunctioning. So let's start with hypoparathyroidism and its causes. So sometimes clients are born with abnormal development of that parathyroid, just like our thyroid cretinism. Um, it could also be caused by surgical destruction, such as that thyroidectomy like we, cause, or like we talked about. Remember, we have to remove about 90% of the thyroid in a subtotal thyroidectomy. Um, sometimes they're able to reestablish the parathyroid gland somewhere else in the body, um, but that's not always possible. So the clients will also end up having hypoparathyroidism. Um, and then another cause is chronic vitamin D deficiency. So hypoparathyroidism clinical manifestations, I want you to think about when you have hypoparathyroidism, you're going to have hypocalcemia. Um, so the parathyroidism, or the parathyroidism, wow, okay. Oof. The parathyroid, it's not working to balance that calcium in our blood and our bones. So we'll have less than the normal amount. And the biggest clinical manifestation with hypocalcemia are that positive Shavastic and the positive Trousseau sign. So the Shavastic sign is when we tap the side of their face with our finger and the client will involuntary twitch. Um, I want you to immediately think hypocalcemia if you ever see that. And the other thing is the trousseau sign is where you um, use a blood pressure cuff to pump it up and the client will involuntarily create like a claw-like arm, it'll tense up. Can also cause um, nervous system irritability, that hypocalcemia. Um, so manifestations like decreased cardiac output and heart crack contractility, they'll have prolonged QT interval dysrhythmias, so we'll want to be putting them on a cardiac monitor if we think that they have hypocalcemia. Um, psych psychiatric manifestations can also occur, like depression, psychosis, anxiety, irritability, memory loss. Um, we can also see increased intracranial pressure, um, so they'll complain of a very severe headache, and this can lead to seizures. So we want to put them on seizure precautions. Um, and it can cause a bunch of other things. So we really don't want them to have hypo help, hypocalcemia at all. So diagnostics. Um, what we're going to see is a decreased parathyroid hormone, decrease in calcium, and remember that seesaw effect, increase in phosphorus. Some additional labs really depend on the causes um, that we're looking for, like chronic kidney disease. Um, so we draw a CBC, a BUN, and creatinine, a glomular filtration rate, with, which is a GFR, which just shows how well our kidneys are getting rid of um, are just filtering. Um, so we they might also draw a vitamin D, just look for deficiency, and then a magnesium level. And then if we take an x-ray, the bones will appear excessively dense. So medical management of hypoparathyroidism, of that hypocalcemia, 
Obviously, we want to treat any emergent complications. Um, by doing this, we would give IV calcium gluconate, and we would give this slowly and have them on a cardiac monitor via telemetry. <clears throat> and then if they're having seizures, we would give them sedative hypnotics, um, possibly benzodiazepines to um, lower that nervous system irritability. Um, we would have them in a quiet and dark environment. Um, so really what we want to be doing is giving them combinations of calcium, magnesium, vitamin D, and then thiazide diuretics, which help to reduce urinary calcium excretion because we want all the calcium that we can get. So medical management of chronic hypoparathyroidism, well, we're going to have to tell our clients that they're going to be on oral, oral calcium supplements for the rest of their lives. Um, and then phosphate binders, because calcium and phosphate go together. So we want to give these to help bind um, and be bioavailable in the body. And then that we might also put them on vitamin D supplements. But we want to encourage them to eat um, foods high in calcium, low in phosphorus, um, and then avoid any phosphorus content that reduces calcium absorption. So good education here. And our goal is to, you know, maintain a normal calcium level. Okay, so let's move on to hyperparathyroidism. So hyperparathyroidism, it's caused by an overproduction of parathormone by the parathyroid glands, and it's characterized by bone decalcification and the development of renal calculi or kidney stones that contain calcium. So half of all people with hyperparathyroidism really don't have any symptoms. But there's other clients who this may occur secondarily because they have chronic kidney failure or phosphorus retention that creates hyperphosphatemia. And then others that have chronic vitamin D deficiency can also cause hyperparathyroidism. So when you think of hyperparathyroidism, um, clinical manifestations and complications, I want you to think of stones, bones, moans, and groans. Um, because what we'll have is kidney stones, we'll have bone pain, um, they'll have abdominal pain, moans, and groans. Um, from being constipated, having abdominal pain, renal calculi and obstruction, and then bone pain. So that's a fun way to remember hyperparathyroidism. And when we have a calcium level that is very high, there might be crises like leading to acute renal failure, coma, or even death. So opposite diagnostics of um, hypoparathyroidism, now we have high parathyroid hormone, high calcium, and low phosphorus. And on a, the x-ray, it'll show porous bone. So our nursing priorities are going to be related to complications. Um, so impaired uro, urinary elimination from the stone, uh, kidney stones. Um, which can also create fluid and electrolyte imbalances. Um, and with hypercalcemia, we can have cardiac and tissue perfusion um, problems, um, constipation, pain, and then they'll have risk for injury like bone fractures. So just how are we gonna prioritize them? What um, interventions are we gonna do? So hyperparathyroidism can be treated with a parathyroidectomy, so removal of one or more of the glands, and it's the most effective treatment. And the post-op care is going to be just like the subclinical um, thyroidectomy, so we want to monitor for hypocalcemia. And then if they're not a candidate for surgery, we can treat them with conservative therapy, um, so hydrating, um, 
bisphosphonates like alendronate, which help to put the calcium back into the bones and not in our bloodstream. And we can also give calcitonin and oral phosphates to decrease the calcium short term. We can also give diuretics to um, offload that calcium. And while we're hydrating, we don't want them to be um, fluid overloaded. So this can help with that. Um, we want to encourage that their mobility, want them to have uh, report any nausea and vomiting. Um, and nutritionally, we want to tell them not to get too much calcium and then increase their vitamin D um, in their, uh, their food or maybe supplement. And then constipation management. So, you know, we know how to intervene with constipation, like stool softeners, increasing mobility, hydration. And then education, obviously we're gonna be educating them about medications, their mobility, we're gonna be pushing fluids and bowel maintenance. This is kind of like a repeat of the last slide. So sorry about that, but it's just, you know, I want you to get that down. So one last complication, and this is the complication that occurs with hyperparathyroidism, which can lead to hypercalcemia. And we call this a hypercalcemic crisis. It um, is a calcium level over 13 milligrams per deciliter, and this can result in neurologic, cardiovascular, and kidney damage. So what we would need to do is emergent and rapid rehydration with large volumes of isotonic saline fluid to maintain that urine output and try to protect those kidneys. That's gonna be really important. Um, and this will be combined with calcitonin and bisphosphonates. The calcitonin helps to lower that calcium in the blood and puts it back into the bones, as well as the bisphosphonates with alendronate. They're also gonna be help um, given to block that calcium reabsorption. Um, and they actually promote calcium deposit back into the bones and reduce GI absorption of calcium. And we also give IV or oral furosemide, which is a loop diuretic, and this can help prevent fluid overload and removing that excess calcium. Um, and sometimes in severe cases, the client will be taken to dialysis and we'll have to remove the excess calcium that way. Okay, that concludes all the content for exam two. And I hope you enjoyed this lecture. I will see you in class for our fun activities and I hope you have a great day.